I've been afloat now as a permanent liverboard for about three years now. For most of that time, I managed to stay working, working remotely for a company in America. But I got laid off in 2018, and that's more than a year ago. Since then, I've been living off capital and savings, but I'm getting to the stage where I have to start thinking of getting an income. So I'm starting to think in terms of the way most yachties do, uh, and they start to think of ways of staying afloat. And the first one that obviously comes to mind is to charter your boat. So that's what I'm planning to do. So the reason I'm telling you this here on my channel is I really would prefer to charter to Doomers if anybody is interested. I really don't fancy the idea of uh, having these rather awkward conversations for a Duma with uh, pre-realists. You know, the conversations you know, the ones about how their kids are going to start a career and where they're going to be in 20 years and how people have retirement plans in three decades or more. Those are very awkward conversations for a Duma like me and I prefer not to have them. Now, I'd really prefer not to go back to my regular profession of software programming and software architecture. I may have to go back eventually, but I'd prefer not to, mainly for the ethical reasons. I don't think software and automation is doing anybody, this planet or society, much good at all. So I'm thinking in terms of doing something more fulfilling, and that's why I'm announcing the Farewell to Nature Cruises. Basically, I'm offering my boat as a skipper charter here in Greece, in the Ionian, this summer, 2019. So in this episode, we'll just take a departure and uh, just we'll show you around the boat and explain to you what it would be like actually getting a charter. Now, the first thing you might want to know is how much is it? Well, I'm pretty flexible about how much uh, I would charter the boat for, but to give you an idea that uh, my boat's a Lagoon 380 S2, and the normal commercial rates for charter is about uh, 2,000 euros to 3,000 euros for a week. Uh, to get, that gives you the idea of what the market price is, but uh, really it can comfortably accommodate four extra people and me the skipper. So it's, it would be a skipper charter uh, for four people and then four people would share that the price somewhere between uh, 2,000 to 3,000 euros for, for a week. Um, so if you're not used to sailing, um, I've got to show you around the boat and explain to you how a skipper charter works and set your expectations because it might surprise you uh, if you've never sailed before and you don't know how this actually works. I want to set your expectations really, really low. Now, the reason is that there's a lot of uh, psychological studies that say that Freud was actually wrong about his pleasure principle. He assumed that everybody chases pleasure and, you know, it's basically gratification of pleasure keeps people coming back for more. Uh, when psychologists looked into it, they found that that wasn't actually correct. You actually only get a dopamine response when you actually uh, get an unexpected pleasure. So if you pursue a pleasure and achieve it, you don't actually get a dopamine response. You get a dopamine response for something novel, an unexpected bonus, a pleasure you never expected. Which is kind of odd because our whole society and capitalism in general is set up uh, essentially to disappoint you. Because competition makes people have to oversell things and over advertise. And so your expectations are very high for the products and services that you get. And it automatically leads to a disappointment and a dopamine low. So I want to do the opposite, and I want to set your expectations really low. So I'm not a bad salesman. I just want to uh, tell you the, the negative sides of sailing and what it's like to actually charter a boat if you, if you don't actually know what it's like being afloat and you've, you've never actually sailed before. So, yeah, um, I'm going to downplay it a lot, and you might be wondering why I'm, so, I'm showing you all these these negative things instead of playing it up. And that's the reason. So uh, I would like you to have a fantastic experience uh, in the Ionian uh, here in Greece. And with uh, a boat, you can experience nature in a way that is very rare 
um, and it's a fantastic way to get in touch with nature. And I think at this stage of the game, that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to show people uh, nature and I would like to show them the ocean um, uh, because I think for a lot of people, climate change and uh, the environmental catastrophe we're going through is very abstract. And there is, the world is still intact. It's not, uh, it hasn't actually collapsed yet. So th there's a fantastic world to see and I would like to show it to people. And so that's what I'm offering. Now, I'm not really set up for, for chartering. I'm not licensed to charter. So this would have to be something really quite um, unofficial. Basic, basically, it would be go under the rubric of maybe a week's sailing instruction or, some, or something like that. But in, in essence, it's a skippered charter uh, for a week. And I'll explain to you how skippered charters work. Now, if you are interested, then send me an email. Uh, here's my email address down below. But I'll show you around the boat and explain all the nitty-gritty of what it's like to be afloat and what it's like uh, to charter a boat because I think if you've never done it and you don't know about sailing, it, it will be very surprising for you. Um, the first thing that may be surprising for you is that this is not a pleasure cruise. So when you, when you charter a boat, uh, you the crew. So you have a skipper charter, I'm the skipper. The skipper doesn't make meals for you and uh, pour you drinks. It's actually the other way around. <laughs> you make tea for the skipper and you make the skipper's meals. Uh, you actually have to buy the food and you have to actually cook it yourself. And that's just the way it is on, on yachts. Uh, okay, I must make another point uh, here too, and that's that people are very spoilt, especially with travel now, and they go on excursions, and if they go on, you know, whale watching and there isn't a whale, they want their money back. If things turn bad or there's a delay and they miss their flight, then they want a refund. Well, it doesn't work that way on boats. Uh, you are pretty much at the beck and call of Poseidon and nature, and uh, things go wrong on boats. Uh, you, there might not be any wind, and you just becalmed and you miss your flight. You, you might, uh, you might have awful weather and storms, and you might be seasick the whole time. You don't get a refund for anything like that. Uh, the boat still costs money, and it costs maintenance, and actually the maintenance goes up in those adverse um, situations. So that's that's the next thing to know that. Chartering a yacht is not the normal um, pleasure cruise where, you know, if you don't get uh, the corner of your pillow turned over, then you can demand your money back. It's not quite like that at all. I must also insist on a very odd thing, but I've learned this from bitter experience. And, and for the sake of your trip and your pleasure on this boat, if you come aboard, I must insist on taking all your electronic devices off you, putting them in a locker and giving them back to you when you leave the boat. Now, that might put you into terror, but if you're going to see nature, you have to detox from the modern world and technology. But just in general, just, just for my sanity, uh, if everybody on board is yeah, there's a ping every 10 minutes and somebody's texting and then it's, oh, you know, news from the royal wedding or there's, you know, Kate just had another baby or something like that. It really, really uh, ruins the atmosphere and ruins, ruins a trip. I've had people on board that, you know, the boat's been in trouble and they've needed to suddenly get somewhere with a fender and they've been like, oh, Hang on a minute, I just want to send out this text. Now, you just cannot do that, just from the point of safety. Um, there's point of view of, of connectivity, but if you want to wreck a cruise for everybody on board, uh, you just need one person that's having a long distance breakup with a boyfriend or something that absolutely wrecks it for everybody. Uh, a boat is a very close community, and so it's better not to be able to have that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, people will, fight, you know, get into a big panic because we're not getting somewhere and they're going to miss the flight or, or some other person that they chose to meet or something like that. I've had that again and again. It just ruins trip after trip because your mind is in the wrong place. Your mind is in the Kronos world of this, you know, 
living by the clock. Um, and uh, in a boat, boats are very contradictory to schedules. Uh, they don't work well with uh, fixed dates, fixed times. Um, you have to fit in with the weather, the boat, and nature. Uh, they don't bend for you. So this is the, one of the first things, and one of the selling points it, you give is really is a detox. If you're going to see nature, you need a detox, and that means uh, cutting off from all your electronic gadgets and goodies. So if you've got a musical instrument, if you've got a guitar, if you've got good books to read, bring them. But leave the Game Boy and the electronics at home. You won't appreciate it being out here if you bring all the gadgets. Yeah, you won't see nature. Uh, everybody will be running around taking selfies. Um, and so pretty soon, you know, you're just doing stuff for the sake of getting a good selfie so you can put it up on Instagloat and show all your friends. And you're not actually here. You're not actually present in mind and you're not actually enjoying nature. And I want to give you your money's worth. So I need to save you from yourself. And I must insist all electronics they get stashed away at the beginning of the trip and you get them back at the end. Otherwise, you're just not really here and you might as well go to Disneyland and have a virtual reality experience of sailing. Okay, now let me show you around the boat and I'll show you some of the things, more things that might shock you about life on a boat. Uh, so let's go to the head, uh, which is the toilet. It's the very first thing that you normally get orientation on when you first get on a boat. So let's assume you just joined the boat and I'll, I'll show you what, uh, what you'd be given in orientation so that you see it now and you're not shocked if, you've, uh, if you're not a yachty and you don't know the drill. So come with me. <coughs> Okay, so these are the cabins here. We can comfortably accommodate four people. So the this is the stateroom, the aft stateroom. And here you can see this nice little feature where you can watch the fish in the morning. But here, yeah, you can see there's a skylight and a fantastic window window view and there's a port light um, so yeah there's this cupboard space and um, you have your own cabin so this um, that's pretty much good for for two people and quite comfortable so going forward this is the forward cabin and this is a v-berth so it's not quite as comfortable and yeah if you bring four guests then they share the costs so whatever the charter costs um say uh two thousand to three thousand euros then you share it amongst four people so you might uh, be thinking, oh, well, can you just have one and uh, have one person and have it prorated? Well, uh, not easily. So that's not normally done with a boat. And I really wouldn't like to do it because uh, the boat has fixed costs. Um, and so it doesn't prorate very easily. You know, um, you can't have one person on board instead of four and run a quarter of the engines or you have quarter of the wear and tear on so um, yeah I I would prefer that uh, it's a normal charter where you have a week's charter for a fixed price and then you can pack as many people on board as you dare is the norm but I got to tell you that if you have more than four people on board uh, with me that makes five um, it's starting to get a little bit crowded, so I would not recommend more than four. Um, and deciding uh, the breakdown on who gets the V berth, uh, this this berth here, which is not as comfortable as that berth. You, um, yeah, it's up to up to you and the people on board to decide. So now this is the head. 
So, uh, let me show you how a head works. The, normally with orientation, you would be given uh, this bit of shocking information. So, this is how you flush a head, and this is one of the things you've shown. Um, so, switch that over to wet bowl. Uh, you can fill with seawater. Okay. Dry bowl. And you empty. Empty and flush. Now, here's the shocker. The only thing that goes in the head is stuff that you've either eaten or drunk. No tampons, no toilet paper, and you need to flush about 15 times, 15 strokes of that plunger, uh, because uh, if there's anything left in the pipes, and there's about a two meter pipe there, it will calcify. And I've had to change that calcified pipe more than once, and it is a truly horrible job. But even um, even just a, a bit of pee left in the in the head um, overnight is enough to, to calcify it, and people learn that the hard way. So, you think, well, if you can't use uh, toilet paper, how does it work? Well, um, if you a liverboard sailor like me, then I, I decided to go the way of most of the world, um, and uh, Asia and the Arab countries, and just use water. And it works like a charm. Uh, so, yeah, um, you start to realize why Arabs think uh, Western people are so dirty, and we are. Uh, toilet paper is not a very good way uh, to, to cleanse yourself. So I would recommend water if you just absolutely have to have toilet paper. Then you have to fold it up and put it in a little Ziploc bag. And then you carry it ashore and dump it ashore whenever we get to shore. So, yep, uh, not my choice, but some people prefer doing that. So this is how it works here in the head. Um, you can see this uh, This works so that you can have a shower right here um, in this. So it uh, works pretty much like a normal shower head. Um, and yeah. Um, so you can shower in here. That's uh the really the the cruise shower um and actually there's also on the other hull um i can show you there is uh there is a a very big shower that's a real luxury for a yacht so let me let me take you across to the other hull and yep um this is for the master stateroom um, but yeah I don't mind if people use this uh, this shower so this is the master stateroom shower and here this is a rarity on um, on a yacht um, so it's one of the special features of this um, owner's version of a um, Lagoon 380 so, okay, so now uh, the other bit of sh a shock um, is that everything on a boat is actually measured. And that, by that I mean uh, electricity, water, um, everything that you at home just assumes comes out of a wall by magic. It doesn't really come out of a wall by magic on a boat. So let me give you an example. Is if when you have a shower, it's a military shower, it means you have to wet yourself, then you have to uh, put on soap uh, with the water off. Then when you've all soaped up, you can switch the water on again and rinse it off. Um, so there's a desalinator on board, so we make our own water. We make our own water from those solar panels. So the the desalinator produces about 30 liters an hour. Uh, so you can't use water like you do at home willy-nilly. 
uh, everything has to be measured out. So for example, uh, I got rid of the kettle that I had and I started using these little pots which are quite common in, in Greece. Um, and the reason is people would do what they normally do in England say and they just fill up the kettle and then you know use the gas and have a small cup of tea or something out of a big kettle and keep on refilling it and reusing it as very efficient in terms of gas use and in terms of uh, water use so then you know having these little pots forces people to have more or less a cup uh, heat up just a cup when they have a cup of tea um, so yeah you can only make water when the sun is shining and there's uh, enough um, electricity coming through the solar panels now there are a lot of things like uh, a microwave oven for example up there a lot of uh, here's an induction hot plate and electrical equipment like that you can't actually use those off the batteries because you're probably cooking the batteries more than you are actually cooking the food so your batteries won't last long if you abuse them like that so at sea we use gas and in, uh, for washing up, you actually use uh, salt water. So, so salt water to clean uh, dishes, and then a little bit of fresh water to to um, to rinse afterwards. Uh, but it gives you an idea of how you have to meter meter your energy use. Um, you have to meter your water use, um, and it's it's not quite the same if you're in a marina so if you go and dock in a marina then we get shore power then you can use all these appliances and go crazy uh, because you're using 220 volt ac from the shore uh, but you can't really do that with solar power now when you're in a marina then the costs are shared so what happens on a boat uh, on a lot of boats is and, and this boat too is there's a boat kitty so everybody contributes to the kitty and all expenses come out of that kitty in terms of food, drinks, uh, meals ashore, uh, getting more gas, um, getting uh, diesel for the, for the engines, uh, marina fees. All of those come from people topping up the kitty and contributing evenly, uh, myself included, the skipper. So uh, marina... In a marina, the marina fees vary vastly. Some of them you can actually find some places that are free, um, but they rarer around the Ionian and they get filled up um, with with boats uh, that are just staying there for good. But if, in terms of the normal marina, all-purpose marina, you're probably talking about. 50 or 60 euros a day for this boat so it would be shared between everybody on board so that'd be five people normally um, then uh, there's normally a little bit for water that you can get water from the quayside and it's normally you know four euros and unlimited is the last place i was in in kalamata for four euros and unlimited so it gives you an idea of the the kind of costs um, that you face i try and avoid marinas uh, like like crazy and stay at anchor so like i am now then you know we uh, we're at anchor in uh, navarino bay so it's a beautiful place absolutely stunningly beautiful uh, lots of other yachts around um lovely turquoise water and the beaches and uh, and mountains up here so that this is the ideal spot that i try to stay in um, then you use the dinghy to to go ashore so then the the dinghy also it requires uh, a bit of gas for the <coughs> for the for the motor but i in general i i row the dinghy uh, for much much the same reason that's the boat she's a wonderful catamaran 11.5 meters uh, lagoon 380 s2 um very nice sailing and very stable so if you've never been on a catamaran but you've been on a monohull uh, you'll be amazed at how you can actually you know set up a cl glass of wine and um you know have a nice meal on the back deck when you would be healing right over in a monohull and very uncomfortable so yeah in terms of what kind of clothing and stuff you need well it's really t-shirts and shorts all the way through 
um, you barely get out of flip-flops and um, some kind of swimsuit. Um, you possibly need one jacket that's waterproof just in case, in case there's high winds and rain. Um, but even, even then it's not normally cold, uh, if, even if there is a, a storm, in, a summer storm in, in the Ionian and unsettled weather. Right, this, there's a shower here on the back deck, a uh, hot shower. Um, again, uh, hot water, if you run the engines, that heats the, the water. You can heat with electricity, but I really hate, uh, again, using solar to, to heat water. It's not an efficient use of our batteries. So just one more word about um, food and uh, dietary issues. Uh, it's really much, much easier if you have everybody on board uh, liking the same food, so in other words, vegetarian, and increasingly people have so, so many allergies and special dietary needs, uh, it gets really difficult on a boat. You can't really, you don't have the time um, and you don't, probably don't have the resources to make five different meals. Um, that really is, uh, is a way to wreck, uh, wreck the time. So, is really the lowest common denominator of all the food. So I'm quite happy if people are vegetarian to eat or vegan to be strictly vegan or whatever people prefer. But uh, if people people are really fussy um, and uh, you know or have uh, particular allergies, it, it really is problematic on a boat. It's it's, it's difficult to turn. Uh, the boat space into a permanent kitchen and keep on running it so you can serve up you know five or ten different meals a day um, that, that's one, that's also one of the ways to to wreck a good cruise so there's a fridge on board and you can stack it with beer and wine if you prefer you don't have to drink but I certainly do so cheers okay so be, to be crew on the boat uh, how much experience do you need well you probably need to be able to swim. I think it's probably not safe if you are, are not a fairly confident swimmer. Um, I would also suggest that uh, you have some idea of whether you get seasick or not. So it's not a very pleasurable cruise if you have to be doped up on Dramamine the whole time. You probably won't have a very good time. So the better your sea legs are, obviously the more of a fun time you'll have. Um, in terms of skills on a boat and knowledge, yeah, I will train you as much as you like. Uh, it's um, You don't have to know anything. Um, I can actually handle this boat uh, quite comfortably on my own. So you can participate however much you prefer and do as much sailing as you would like and as much training as you would like. So if you're really quick and you uh, manage to get on board by the 27th, I have somebody coming on board on the 27th and he's offered to give a couple of free workshops uh, to anybody who would like them. And uh, they're in marine safety and marine first aid. So he's an expert and he can take you up to any level you would like. Uh, but yeah, that's a, a great bonus uh, for free if you're really quick and you in the next few weeks um, you can get out to Greece. But a uh, great opportunity that is. And of course, uh, I'll give you any uh, seamanship or uh, yacht training that you would, uh, would like as well. So this boat is also strictly non-smoking. So that's not only for safety, it's also to protect the resale value of the boat. So if you can't do without a smoke for two or three days, then perhaps uh, you can try vaping. So without a doubt, I'm sitting in the best seats in the house here, right on the pulpit, right at the bow. And it's fantastic here underway. So I've had some fantastic experiences sitting here, especially with dolphins swimming on either side of the hull and often even between the hulls. If you remember in episode seven, the thumbnail with the dolphins underwater, that was actually taken from right over here. I helped my nephew by his ankles and he went right over the side with his GoPro underwater and that's how we got those shots. They turned out absolutely fantastic. Anyway, a lot of the time is spent uh, doing relaxing and one of the best places to relax and uh, to sunbathe is right here on this trampoline. 
So although this is called a trampoline, it's not really made for jumping on, although the kids really like to. So in terms of kids on board, it's okay to have kids on board as long as they really over about 10, uh, younger than about 10, it becomes a safety issue. Um, and especially with uh, toddlers and babies, this boat is, is not set up like uh, some people who have kids on board uh, set them up. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit too, too risky to have kids that can't take care of themselves and particularly um, are not good swimmers. Well, so that's the opportunity I'm offering and uh, yeah, I hope uh, one or two people um, take me up on it. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm back to the gulag and uh, on the treadmill again doing software that um, would do no good for man or beast. So yeah, welcome aboard and I'm looking forward to hearing your response.